Hello, my very good friends, and welcome to another episode of Time Between Times Storytelling with me, Owen Staten. Thank you for all the positive feedback on last week's story. I'm really glad you enjoyed it. It came out a day early because, as you know, I was involved in a series of book launches for the fabulous book, The Folklore of Wales Ghosts written by my good friend Dr. Delith Bader and Mr. Mark Norman. We did a number of book launches and they were all really well received. And if you're coming to the podcast on the back of seeing me at the launches, welcome, Kreusor. It's good to have you here. I'll put a link for the book in the show notes, so if anyone is interested in buying it, and it is a tremendous read if you are interested in Welsh myths, legends, and especially ghosts. Please take a look at it. But anyway, it's good to have you all back here. The wheel of the year continues to turn and the nights grow darker and dimmer, but our hearts glow with a happy glow. For this is the time of stories. This is the time when tales are in the ascendancy. This, my friends, is the time between times. So sit back, Relax. Close your eyes if it's safe to do so. And just imagine that you were sat by the fireplace in your house. You can hear the rain patting on the window. There is a grey gloom outside. You put down your coffee or your tea and feel it warming inside. Most people would like to sit here for the night. Just turn on the telly box and see what's going on. Listen to the radio or just be lost in their own thoughts. But not us. We have a quest, you see. We have a yearning in our hearts for something more. We stand up, take a last look through the window and dare to brave the weather outside. We put on our coat, maybe now a winter hat and some gloves and open that front door. We brace ourselves against the rain and the wind and close the door behind us before shuffling down the pathway to the road. The cars are zooming past, maybe even one of those electric scooters. And then we turn right, walk up the pavement. We see our wet footsteps behind. And then we make our way to the forest. Like a wall of wood, It stands there as it has stood for centuries. The trees swaying slightly in the breeze. There's the pathway. We look back one more time and look at the lights of civilization, knowing that we are going somewhere else, and step inside the forest. Our feet crunch on the leaves as we make our way into the dark path. There it is, the mossy tower, the one we know so well full of story, full of tale, full of legend. We pass the old babbling brook, place our hand in the water and feel the cool. The rain has stopped in here. The trees shelter us, just like the tales do when times are tough. And there we find the fire pit at the heart of the forest the place that only a few people know, and they are all here, our friends who gather for tales traditionally told. As we step into the clearing, they all turn and look at us, greet us with smiles. We step forward, shake hands, hug and embrace, knowing this time is precious, for this is a time that we look forward to every week, for this is the time between times. The time it's neither night nor day, but the sun has gone and the sky is grey. The time when the veil between our world and the fairy world grows wafer, wafer thin. So thin that for a few moments, just a few moments, we can reach into their realm and they can reach into ours. For now is the time that people see the lights in the sky. Now is the time that people see the Talwith Teg. Now is the time. The people see ghosts. Now 
is the time between times. Make good use of this time, for it is short, but it is precious, and it is now. The storyteller stands and begins his tale, a tale that happened two hundred years ago this very night, in a rocky cove off Morwinstow in Cornwall. It was a stormy night like nobody had seen for hundreds of years. The wind was so strong that one could barely stand, and the rain fell like stones from the sky. The noise was unbelievable, and there off the coast a ship tossed and turned on the highest of waves. From the safety of their houses the people of Cornwall looked out and wondered how anyone could survive such a sea. The ship was tossed about, almost like it had fallen under the waves many times. And for one woman, a woman called Dina Harper, who stood on the beach with her horse looking out to sea, although it was madness to do so, she wondered if that ship would ever see a safe port. Suddenly the ship seemed to vanish, as if all the lights upon it had suddenly been extinguished, as if, like a ghost, it had gone back to the other world. She gave a short prayer for all those upon it, but then saw with wonder that there was someone swimming towards the shore, Although the waves were higher than anything she had ever seen, this person seemed stronger than them. As it grew closer, she saw that it was a huge man with a great big black beard. He stood in the waters as it smashed around him and then walked to the shore. His clothes were soaked to the skin, but he barely shivered. He stepped forward and climbed onto the back of her horse without a word. And together they rode from the cove into the land inside. He was known as Coppinger, a Viking, a latter-day Viking who travelled the seven seas, causing chaos wherever he went, and he made his home in Cornwall with Dina Hamlin. A cruel, caustic man he was. There in a small farm they rent chaos wherever they went. He gathered together a group of smugglers that caused all the roads almost to be closed. Such was the fear to travel them when his gang was around. They were known as Coppinger's Tracks and his gang would wait in ambush for any carts or coaches to pass before stepping out and robbing them blind. The government and the authorities seemed powerless against him. Such was his cruelty. He was the biggest man that anyone had ever seen. Some say he stood at seven feet tall. He was the strongest man that anyone had ever heard of. He could lift the largest of stones and he was the cruelest man. His marriage with Dina was hard and heartless, but together they worked well. She hated him, and he hated her. Years passed, and there in a cove near Moringstow he had a cave in the centre of the cliff, one you had to climb down through ropes to use to get inside and there his gang would gather every night to drink rum and think about who they would next rob or what ship they would wreck. Far away in London, he was spoken about in Parliament. Such was his renown, and eventually the army came together to try and drive him from the land, and one night, at the time between times, the time when it is neither night nor day, but the sun had gone and the sky was grey, the soldiers gathered nearby, waiting near the cliff and the cave for his gang to arrive. As the sun started to set, they saw them slowly trickle up towards the cave, ready to abseil down and into its depths. But the soldiers were well hidden, and they leapt out, guns blazing, 
before Coppinger knew what had hit him, five of his gang had fallen down dead, all of them struck by bullets. He drew his sword and rushed at the soldiers, followed by his gang, and there on the cliffs above Morningstow Bay, a great battle took place. The government of Britain and its troops against the rebellious and horrible Coppinger. Throughout the night the battle blazed. The troops retreated, then the gang retreated. Many men breathed their last that night, but before the dawn had broken the next day, Coppinger found himself on the beach with his back to the sea on a line of soldiers stepping towards him, their bayonets raised. He stepped forward and cried into the night, calling to the dark gods, calling to his Viking ancestors as he stood there ready for battle. But he must have known his time was up. There were fifty soldiers and only him. They all raised their guns to fire one final volume which surely would see him fall to his doom. And suddenly he dropped his sword turned around, looked up at the cliffs of his adopted home and smiled and then slowly walked backwards into the sea. The water lapped around his ankles, lapped around his knees, around his waist. The soldiers lowered their guns in confusion and just watched. The sea was wild and rough. The sea was wild and windswept, but Coppinger seemed to laugh as again he stepped back. The soldiers all looked up, and to their horror they saw something they did not think they would ever see, for there on the sea itself, on this treacherous tide, a ship suddenly sailed into view. The same ship that many years before Dina had seen flounder on the waves. But it was back. It was back indeed. Coppinger laughed, his laugh echoing through the cove, and then turned and dived into the waves. The soldiers rushed to the beach and looked out, and they saw him swimming against the waves, stronger than any shark. He seemed to swim faster than any man could run. And still he went, far out to sea. They fired a ragged volley in the hope of getting him. But all they witnessed was him clambering up a rope ladder onto the decks of this ghostly galleon far out to sea. Suddenly the sky was rent by thunder and lightning lit it up like it was day. The soldiers covered their eyes, but then opened them once more and saw that the ship had vanished, along with Coppinger and his black heart. He was never seen again. The roads around Cornwall were now free of his fury, and people could safely travel from town to town without fear of being robbed. But his legend lives on. In every tavern, in every town, tales are told of Coppinger and his deeds to this day. And there in Morinstow, off the cruel seas that bash against the rocks, on a night such as tonight, when the time between times is in essence, you can still hear his cruel laugh and catch a glimpse of his ghostly galleon sailing the settled seas. And that, my friends, is the tale of Coppinger, the cruel, caustic wrecker of Morningstow. Thank you for joining me for this tale at the time between times. My friends, I am so grateful that you choose to spend your time with me. If you enjoy these stories, you might like to join my Patreon at patreon.com forward slash Owen Staten 7. Or maybe buy me a coffee 
at ko-fi.com forward slash Owen Staten. Follow me on Twitter, or X as it's now known. I am at Owen S. Griffiths there, and on most Sunday nights you will find me telling a live tale on Twitter spaces. If you are listening to this on release date, which is the 6th of October 2023, this weekend I will be speaking at the online Nevermore conference. If you Google that and wish to join me on Sunday night between 7.30 and 8.30, you would be more than welcome. I also contribute quite a lot to Weird Wiltshire. I know, Wiltshire. Emma and I are good friends. We met up last week, so please support her and read her blog. And there are many other friends that I have that I wish you would support if you could. Weird in the Wade is another one. A blog, a blog, a podcast I often appear, appear on. Oh, that's wrong as well, isn't it? A podcast where you can often hear my voice, and Natalie, who does that, is very, very passionate about ghost stories and does a wonderful podcast. There is Eerie Essex, my very good friend, Beth and Briggs Miller, who I collaborate for Spectre of the Sea. Hopefully a new episode coming soon. My friends, thank you for joining me today at the Time Between Times. And I will see you again soon for more tales traditionally told. No stop.